think on climate change, what I shared last week, so you know how they were teed up, is that we don't know anything about climate change in Columbus. We no longer have spring or fall. We just have two seasons, winter and summer. And I can't tell you how many times the word climate change came up in my media interface in the last few days. And what I was talking to Stuart about this morning was corn. In the Wall Street Journal this weekend, they said corn is now being grown in Canada. It's increased in 20 years, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That allows them to grow corn. When Stuart and I were chatting this morning, he said, that makes it harder to grow corn than in the traditional corn belt. Because when it's simmering 90s as sensibly as it was, that's not good for corn production. So the corn belt is right now shifting uh, north in latitude. Stuart wants an interactive speech. He's got 800,000 slides. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You went back 800,000 years. And he buried that 800,000 year ago slide. I said, what are we talking about in terms of climate change duration? He goes, well, I buried the slide that has 800,000 years on it. I said, that's a good thing. But he'd like the questions it goes because there's different topic components of this. So don't wait till the end. Be happy to have engagement as he goes. And there'll be Q&A at the end as well. Stuart Ludson from Associate Professor at Ohio State University. The mic is yours. Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, today what I want to do is just give a sort of a, an introduction to climate change. And if I do my job well enough, at the end of this talk you'll have a better sense of what climate change is, how had how has it uh, affected Ohio and how might it affect Ohio in the future, as well as what's causing it. So in terms of how I structure this uh, presentation today, there's, there's five central things that I want to try to accomplish. The first is just give a, a brief introduction to me and why I'm here so that you have a, a, a better sense of why maybe you should listen to me. Secondly, I'll talk a little bit about what climate change is and differentiate that from weather. Afterwards, I'll talk a little bit about how climate has changed in Ohio and what the implications are for Ohio's economy. And then uh, briefly spend some time talking a little bit about the causes of climate change. And then finally, just provide a few take-home messages to you. So to begin, I just want to give you just a, a sense of, of who I am and, and, and why I'm talking about a topic that I'm, I'm really not an expert in. So to begin, just background, I'm a native Ohioan, grew up in Cleveland and graduated from Cleveland Heights High School some 30 years ago. Uh, did an undergraduate degree in zoology at Miami University and then, yes, yes. Uh, and then went to Auburn and uh, did a fisheries, uh, master's in fisheries there before coming back to Ohio State. And so I actually did a PhD um, in, uh, at Ohio State University, finished up in 2000, very heavily focused on, on uh, fisheries and aquatic ecology. After doing a little bit of a, a post, uh, postdoc, a couple years stint in, at the University of Windsor in Canada, I became a permanent uh, research scientist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So these are the, the, the agency that looks at weather uh, patterns and worked at a, uh, a lab called the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab up at the state to the north of us. After um, spending about five years there um, and, and realizing that the science that I was, was doing wasn't making a large enough impact on, on society, um, I came back to Ohio State where I could get into the classroom and, and begin to educate. And um, I'm now the co-director of Aquatic Ecology Laboratory. I continue to do a lot of fisheries work and I think about climate science in that work. So my background is really thinking about things like yellow perch and walleye. So these are, are big fisheries uh, in Lake Erie. They support a billion dollar a year industry that's associated with fishing. And I'm really working, spend a lot of time working with fisheries management agencies like the, the Ohio Division of Wildlife trying to help them understand what's driving the dynamics of these fisheries. And in the course of that work, I've really started to look at the impact of humans. So as we have um, lots of nutrient runoff coming into places like Lake Erie and Grand Lake St. Mary's and other reservoirs around the state, they can lead to, to harmful algal blooms, these, these noxious blooms of cyanobacteria that carry toxins that also might affect fish as well as human health. And they can in turn lead to what we call dead zones or these low oxygen zones that can form in the middle of central uh, Lake Erie. And these two features are heavily impacted by our climate. And so in the end, I've been thinking a lot about climate from the perspective of fisheries. And so with that said, 
I am not a climate scientist, I'm not a, climate, a climatologist, I'm an ecologist who happens to know a lot about climate change because it's what I study to help understand these fish populations. So hopefully I can answer your questions, but there'll be some things I may not be able to answer because I'm not a climate expert. In terms of why I'm actually talking then about climate change, um, it's in large part because this is sort of, to me, doing a, a bit of community service. I have lots of friends and family who don't understand what climate change is. I know something about it, and at least I think I know enough about it that I can come before you and, and, and tell you at least what my interpretation of the climate literature is. And so to me, in my job, I try to impart knowledge. And if you have knowledge about something, that gives you some power because it allows you to make informed decisions. And the other reason that I'm, I'm here is because I have two young kids, a 13 and a 10-year-old, that are gonna face climate change head on in the future. I'm old enough that I may be able to escape some of these things, but what we're doing to our climate is gonna impact their wealth, uh, their health and well-being. And so by creating an educated society and by talking with folks like you, I hopefully can work towards uh, having an informed public that might eventually make decisions that could benefit my kids. So there's a selfish reason for being here as well. In terms of what climate change is, I just want to make sure we're on the same page, and I want to differentiate this from something we think about and talk about or, or look at every day, and that's the weather. So if we think about what weather is, we're really talking about the state of, of um, the atmosphere at a specific location. So let's say in, in Columbus today with respect to temperature, moisture, clouds, precipitation, et cetera. When we think about weather, it's a transient feature. So we're thinking about time scales that are operational, maybe thinking about hours to, to years. And so if we look at a long-term graph of temperature data, so these are basically mean temperatures, average temperatures um, across the continental United States from 1960 to 2020. When we talk about weather, we're talking about individual data points, years on this plot. So we might have a very warm year, like in 2012, or we might have a very cold year, like in 2010. That's basically weather, short-term changes in the state of the atmosphere. When we talk about climate, and I talk about changing climate, we're talking about long-term conditions. We're talking about changes in the average temperature or precipitation, for example, over long periods of time that range from decades to perhaps millennia, thousands of years. And so in this particular graph, when I refer to climate change, we're not interested in the year-to-year -year variability. That's weather. We're talking about the long-term trend in that year-to-year -year variability. That's what climate change is. And so here we're talking about a change, an insignificant increase in climate over the past 60 years in this, in this graph. And what's important to also note from this graph is it helps understand how Oh, excuse me. The other thing I was going to say is you could also think about climate in terms of decadal changes, 30 years here versus 30 years here. The other thing to take home from this, this graph that's important to recognize is that we can get cold spells, cold weather events in a warming climate. So here's a long-term trend of temperature through time showing warming, yet we can have these exceptionally cold years during this time frame. So this is how we can have a freezing cold winter like 2014 and 2015, yet still be in a very warm climate setting. In terms of expectations, so I've tried to kind of take the literature and synthesize what we've seen in terms of the last 100 years in terms of temperature and precipitation patterns, what we might see into the future, and then how that might impact things that we care about, the, the services that our ecosystems provide and, and the industries that, that um, depend on those um, ecosystems. And so where I want to start is just talking a little bit about climate patterns that we've seen historically in Ohio and what the, it, we might expect to see into the future. Everything that I'm going to talk about basically came from a report. So I, again, I'm not a climate scientist doing climate-related research. I read about the research that other scientists are doing and reporting out. And so the, the facts and the things that I'm going to talk about all derive from a whole bunch of reports, one of which just came out last Friday uh, by the fourth National Climate Assessment was just released um, talking about the impacts on regions like the Midwest. And then there's lots of reports dedicated to Ohio and the Great Lakes region. So everything I'm going to talk about is backed up by the scientific literature. <clears throat> 
In terms of what we've seen in Ohio over the past 100 years, we've seen an increase in temperature if we start there. And this increase in temperature is expected to continue into the future unless we begin to control greenhouse gas emissions. So in terms of temperature change here, I've got a plot, uh, a figure of um, the Great Lakes region and what observed temperatures look like um, over the past uh, 60 years or so. And what you can see is that on average, there's a little bit of variation across the region. This is Ohio down here. But on average, in the Great Lakes region, we've seen a two degree Fahrenheit or so increase in average temperatures, with Ohio only increasing by about a degree, and Columbus, the average temperature in Columbus going up by two degrees Fahrenheit over the course of the past uh, 60 years or so. If we look to the future, what we're gonna see is more of that. We'll see lots of warming, particularly in the winter, so less cold days and cold nights and less ice cover that'll, that'll come with that, as well as in the spring, and extreme temperatures in the summertime that may lead to excessive heat waves. And so if we stay with what I call status quo conditions, business as usual, greenhouse gas emissions, the expectation is that across the state of Ohio, if we look at the mid part of the century, so about 20 years from now, we should see temperatures increase to about four degrees on average in the state of Ohio, slightly less warming um, in, the, in the southern part of the state relative to the north. In terms of extreme temperatures, we are expected to see lots more days greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So on average, if you, depending on if you look at Cincinnati to Cleveland, the kind of bracket the ends of the state, the expectation is that we should see roughly 40 to 60 more days that are above 90 degrees every year or so on average in the mid part of the century. So just about 20 years out from now. Similarly, when we look at precipitation patterns, we've seen increases in precipitation, about twofold uh, increase as a whole with heavy precipitation events like we've been seeing a lot this spring and fall happening. If we compare the climate from 1980 to um, 2010 to the 30 years prior to that, we see that the there's been a major percent change in heavy rainfall events with about 78 more days per year having heavy rain events than in, historic in the past historically. And overall, in Columbus, precipitations increased by 20%. So the raininess and the flooding that we've been seeing is something, it's real, it's, it's a, it's a long-term trend to that. And that trend is expected to continue into the future. The expectation is that we're gonna see rainier winters, springs, and falls, with the summer actually becoming a bit drier. And so there's projections that have been made, again, to the mid part of the century here, so about 20 years from now. Again, keeping greenhouse gas emissions where they're at now, business as usual. And the expectation is that we're gonna see increases in temperature, particularly in, the, in um, parts of Ontario, with increases in Ohio being about three to four inches per year on average. That amounts to basically a 33% increase in rainfall during winter and spring. And again, the expectation is that in the summertime, uh, heavy rain events will decline by about 5%. So a little bit of disparity, seasonality to the raininess. When you start to take these trends and put them together and ask what the climate of Ohio might look like into the future, the climate that my kids are gonna experience is different from the Ohio that I grew up in. And so when we look at what temperatures might look like in the winter time, in, in, in sort of current times versus what it might look like at the end of the century, the winters here are gonna be much more like Virginia, which some of you might like, but the summers are gonna be like the tropical paradise of Arkansas. So hot, hot, hot. Um, but this is, a, this is a reality. This is where if we go on this business as usual scenario, this is what Ohio's climate will continue to look like, just it, it, you know, you know, whether 20 years out, 10 years out, or towards the end of the century. With that backdrop now, what I wanna talk about what this means for those who perhaps do business um, in Ohio and who live in Ohio. I could have spent an hour talking about the potential impacts to Ohio. There's a lot of information out there. And what I've tried to do for the sake of time is just glean it down to a few general slides that, that sort of are encapsulating what I've um, read on this topic. 
And so where I want to start is just by talking a little bit about agriculture. So agriculture is a huge industry in Ohio. It accounts for some 400,000 jobs, which is roughly 13, 14% of the workforce. It's a 30 plus billion dollar a year industry when you start to think about all the food that's associated with that agriculture. One expectation might be that with increases in growing seasons, and that's something that's been occurring, we've seen an, a, a longer growing season on average about nine days per year, and it's expected to get longer in the sense of maybe 40 to 60 days longer by the mid-century if we do business as usual. So despite the, the potential for growing seasons to benefit agricultural production, the bottom line is all the reports and everything I've looked at suggests that agriculture is going to take a, a big negative hit with climate change. Because things like the heavy rains that are going to lead to flooded agricultural landscapes, especially on landscapes where there are no drainage tiles and ways to get rid of that water, combined with the heat during the summer, combined with the expansion of, of pests, things like the earworm that are only located to southern locales where it's historically been warm, they're ex expected to expand up into Ohio. These three things are expected to lead to a decline in agricultural production in terms of food crops as well as stress um, livestock um, operations. And so as we start to get these 90 plus degree weather days, as Callaway mentioned, those temperatures are not suitable for wheat, corn, and soybean. They get stressed out. So agriculture, is, in some reports I've read, productivity may decline to levels like that in the 1980s unless we have some technological fixes. Human health also is expected to take a negative hit with the kinds of conditions that we see associated with the increases in temperature and precipitation. We should expect more heat-related deaths and illness, asthma, allergies, and disease all are expected to worsen. Heat waves are going to become more common, and so the fear is that we're going to get these, these multiple-day heat waves that, that can lead to um, sort of uh, a lot of death and hospitals being overrun in places like um, Chicago that occurred back in 1995. Um, and so heat-related stress is going to be a big issue, particularly with the elderly. Air pollution is expected to worsen. So as we get temperatures that are greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that leads to ozone production down at the ground level, which is an air pollutant. In addition, when it's that hot, we start running our air conditioners more, which puts a, a, a higher demand on electricity, which means more coal is going to be burned, which means more soot. And in turn, that's all going to hurt those who have allergies, or excuse me, have asthma. Those who have allergies are going to be negatively affected by increasing pollen loads. So while agricultural crops like soybean, corn, and wheat may not do very well in high temperatures, weedy species that can grow very fast and produce a lot of pollen are expected to increase in the, into the future. And then with the increasing uh, precipitation, that's going to lead to um, uh, higher demands and, and uh, stress on our already aging infrastructure leading to more combined sewer overflows that can dump pollutants and bacteria into our waterways where we swim and get, and, and get drinking water. And it's also expected to lead to increases in mosquitoes that might carry West Nile virus, as well as deer ticks that might um, carry Lyme disease. So while I'm not showing you any data, there are studies that are out there trying to, underst trying to understand the impacts of climate change. And the bottom line is the things that I have read suggest not a pretty picture for human health. And then in terms of the things that I think about, in terms of the ecosystems and, and the services that they provide to us, the bottom line is they are being threatened by increasing temperature as well as increasing uh, precipitation that can lead to nutrient runoff off of our agricultural landscapes. So we've seen, probably most of you seen in the news, uh, information and, and uh, stories about increasing harmful algal blooms um, in Lake Erie. These harmful algal blooms are bad because they degrade our beaches where we swim. Nobody wants to swim in pea soup green water, not to mention that this water contains toxins that, that can be an irritant. And those toxins are also um, carcinogenic. They're a liver toxin and can lead to liver necrosis and even death. And so in 2014, some of you may remember that some of this, this toxin, microcystin, got past the drinking supply and basically left 500,000 people in Toledo with an inability to drink water, shower, or bathe. You couldn't boil it off. It just concentrates the toxins. 
the research that my lab is doing is showing that these conditions, increasing temperature and precipitation, are going to lead to more blooms on the order of twofold to fourfold more by the mid century. In addition, the the cyanobacteria and algae that produce these toxins, they're not very edible. They don't really fuel the food web very well. So it basically, it basically goes unused. And there's those phytoplankton, which are just basically little microscopic algae and cyanobacteria, little microscopic bacteria. As they die, they fall to the lake bottom, and then they're decomposed and broken down. And in that process, oxygen is used up. And that's where we get these things called dead zones, these, these hypoxic layers. So you can imagine in the center of Lake Erie, a layer of water that's higher than this room, that's 10,000 square kilometers wide, basically devoid of oxygen. The research I've shown um, shows that fish cannot live and persist in those conditions. They're forced to either live above the low oxygen layer or move to the near shore where there's oxygen. It leads to reduced feeding, it leads to reduced growth, and it can, really, it can lead to mortality in, in the form of fish kills. And so in, this, in the essence, the fisheries that I think a lot about are expected to decline through time by the formation of things like this hypoxic zone in central Lake Erie. And then temperature itself also can have a negative effect on our fisheries. We recently published a, a study on yellow perch showing that the warm winters, the short warm winters that we've been seeing are negatively impacting yellow perch, yellow perch populations in Lake Erie. We can explain a lot of variation in yellow perch by understanding the winter duration. It has a negative effect on their ability to reproduce. We think the same um, effects are happening with walleye. And these are, again, billion dollar a year fisheries that, that um, we're talking about um, taking a hit. So with that background, then the question is, what's causing it? Is there a role for humans um, in, in driving this? So when we begin to understand why we can actually be in this room and have life on this planet, it comes down to the fact that we have greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that allow our surface to be warm and support life. So we have the sun that provides a lot of heat and, and, uh, uh, to the Earth's atmosphere. The heat that's not absorbed by the Earth gets re-radiated back out into space. These greenhouse gases, which consist of things like just water, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, methane, they're naturally occurring in our atmosphere. And what they do is they don't let that long wave radiation, they don't let that heat that's bouncing off the surface escape very much into the atmosphere. So the, the losses out here are very, um, um, tend to be high right now because there's not, historically, not a lot of greenhouse gases. When you start to put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which we've been doing over the past 100 plus years, and this is just a plot of that. So these are basically the millions of metric tons of carbon that have been released into the atmosphere since 1850 to roughly 2009. Most of the carbon emissions, about 80%, come from coal, oil, and gas. The other 20% comes from actually deforestation. By cutting down the rainforest around the world, it takes away a sink for carbon. So we've been putting a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that basically are leading to an intensification of the greenhouse effect. What's happening is the same amount of solar radiation is coming in, but because there's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that radiation cannot escape the atmosphere and is leading to a heating of our planet. And there's lots of positive feedback cycles that I could talk about that are leading to a, a, a rapid, a, an intensification of the point that this, is, this warming is occurring faster and faster and faster. In the end, the question comes up as to whether humans are to blame for this or not. I've taken away the data slides just to, to kind of keep things simple. But when we go into the scientific literature and start to, to ask the experts out there, climate scientists, what they think about climate change, the, the bottom line is they agree that to this statement, scientists agree that human activity is a significant contributing factor to climate change. There is no disagreement among scientists. So there's been several studies that have been conducted asking questions of scientists to, to see what is the consensus among scientists in 2004, 2009, all the way to 2015. And as you can see here, in any given one of these studies, 91 to 100% of the climate experts out there agree 
that humans are uh, uh, playing a significant role in driving the recent warming trends we've been seeing. So in the end, what do I want you to take home from this talk? The first is that climate change is different from weather. We can have day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year variability in the weather, but climate is a long-term phenomenon um, that is predictable over, over the scales, unlike the weather. Secondly, there's lots of empirical data to indicate that climate change has been occurring right here in Columbus, Ohio, in terms of increasing precipitation and heavy rain events. And unless we curb greenhouse gas emissions, it's going to continue into the future. If it continues unabated, um, we expect to have very dire negative social and economic consequences. I gave you some examples with agriculture, human health, and, and in, in my case, the fisheries, the sort of things that I think about, as well as the water uh, quality of places like Lake Erie. In the end, all the empirical data that exists that's out there and all the modeling data that exists that's out there suggest very strongly that humans are playing a predominant role in driving the recent warming trends we've seen over the past century. And while this might be viewed as a negative, the bottom line is I view this as a positive because it means we have the ability to combat climate change. We can lessen its impact. It's not just up to Mother Nature. We actually have the ability to curb that climate. The key thing is we need to act soon because of these positive feedback cycles that I mentioned and I'm happy to take questions on. And with that, I appreciate your attention and if there's time for questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, so what I'm going to ask Stuart to do is repeat the question okay. uh, when someone shows their hands. Very respectful group, no questions during the presentation, so floor you them. Bill Corbett, your last opportunity to ask a question at Columbus Rotary until you come back and visit. And so noted that this is the first question I've ever asked in 10 years. <laughs> um, this is a very uh, interesting topic, and I've spent a lot of time doing my own research on it. In your area, Doctor, is there anything that can be done to help with sequestration? So, um, you know, it, it's pretty clear that we're not going to change our habits a whole lot. We have so far, there's been pretty clear data. So is there any way for what you're doing in your area with fish when you start to get the carbon back out of the uh, air? So the, the question is, um, are there ways in which we could perhaps capture the carbon and, and sequester it so it doesn't get back into the atmosphere? Um, so the bottom line is I think there's a lot of research being devoted to um, trying to find solutions and fixes to sequester the carbon. Um, it's not my area of expertise. I know some of the things that, that um, I've, I've heard about and I don't know the eff effectiveness of, they're trying to inject it deep into the ground. So if you think about where we drill for uh, natural gas, maybe uh, can we store carbon and just take it out of the atmosphere and pump it um, down below. Um, another obvious way is to, is to cut, is to stop um, sort of raising our, our rainforest. So big old growth trees that we find in developing countries, um, like in the Congo River Basin and the Amazon and, and, and other um, parts of, of South America, they, those trees actually capture a lot of carbon dioxide. That's a, carbon dioxide is a primary food for, um, essential food for plants. So one um, key way is to sort is to to replant and and make things greener in the sense of of uh, force uh, that way, um, and I know that there's um, and then the other the other sink that does exist is is the ocean, but the problem with the ocean we can't really control that it's 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 getting saturated with with carbon dioxide it's doing a great job of of taking carbon dioxide but it's also leading to another problem, that's just ocean acidification, because when you take in carbon dioxide, it leads to uh, more acidic conditions that are damaging our corals and, and, and fisheries in that regard. So the punchline is, I don't know all the answers, but there's certainly a lot of, of um, activity devoted to, to you know, looking at ways to do it. Uh, I'll go here and then over there. Uh, I'll go behind, behind you and then I'll come next. From a policy perspective, forget about the national level. Can the state of Ohio, through the governor, do anything in, this, in, in, our, in our state to reduce the carbon emissions? And I'm talking about AEP and who are a big contributor through the coal burning uh, plants that they have. But is your organization or do you, are you aware of anybody working from the scientific side with the governor, with the corporations who are maybe part of the problem? So 
So you answer a political, even though he referenced to the governor. Yep. I will not take a political stance. I, am, I know better than do that. <laughs> uh, so the question was, are, are there any policy ideas or, or things that could be um, undertaken to perhaps um, reduce the carbon footprint in the state of Ohio? So the bottom line is that there's a, a Senate bill, I think it's 221 two, that was introduced um, a few years back, um, that basically is set, in, um, set us on pace to reduce carbon emissions. So Ohio if I'm not mistaken, is already on that path towards reducing um, carbon emissions. And there's some percentages, there's some percent reductions that I don't remember offhand. Um, so the bottom line is absolutely the possibility of implementing policy is, 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 is um, in the toolbox, I would say. I'm personally not working with anybody there. I don't know if others on, on Ohio State's campus are, are thinking about policy. I have to imagine there are. But um, going to greener um, sorts of energy standards and, and using green energy as opposed to maybe fossil fuels is absolutely one potential solution to, to think about. Um, and, I, and I absolutely know it's happening in Ohio. I just don't have the, the numbers um, for you. And I'll say at the national level, um, we've seen a reduction in carbon emissions over the past you know, decade in, in at the national level. I think there's been about a 15% drop in carbon emissions. So I think um, there is awareness out there. I think that there, there's um, a variety of industries and, and, and policymakers who very much want to reduce carbon emissions. Um, the question is, is, it, is, you know, how much is enough and how far can we go without, um, you know, really hurting the economic side of things? Because that obviously is going to weigh in here. Um, you, you've been raising your hand a little bit, and then I'll come to the back over here. You didn't mention anything about what we're constantly bombarded with information about the melting of the polar caps and so forth. What's the effect on, in your area of fisheries as to that problem, the displacement of populations from the coast? So the question um, was, what do we see locally in terms of how climate change impacts things that, that I think about in Ohio, maybe fisheries and, and other things we might think about? So, so in preparing this talk, and I've given other climate change talks a bit more of a, a global scale, and I have lots of slides buried down here that I can show you those sorts of things. Um, the key thing is that we are seeing a footprint of climate change here. I've mentioned, um, you know, the, the potential impacts in terms of agriculture, um, or we, we definitely know that the, 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 the growing zone and the, for, you know, the optimal growing zone for, for plants in Ohio is, is shifting northward, so the Corn Belt is moving northward. Forests are changing, so the composition of, of, of trees are, are showing evidence of climate change. And in terms of what I see in terms of fish populations themselves, um, the expectation and the work that I've done suggests that cold water fish, so you have some fish that really like cold water, some fish that are more warm water species, so a largemouth bass might be a warm water species, walleye is a cold water species. We're starting to see in the Midwest shifts in the distribution of these species. Largemouth bass are becoming much more prominent in lots of, of places because of these warmer temperatures, whereas walleye are starting to become less frequent. So the same kinds of shifts that we see in marine environments with cold water species moving more northward, we're seeing those same things actually happening in our lakes. And Lake Erie itself is not going to be in an environment that's going to support a species like Lake Whitefish for a long time because that is a very cold water species. It's a delicious fish to eat, but there's not enough cold water um, to support it in a place like Lake Erie. So, and time for more. One more question. Was there anything question in the back? Yes. Yeah, I read somewhere that uh, a scientist in Canada has claimed that there has been an evolutionary change in flora and fauna as a result of global warming. Uh, can you comment on that? So the question was, um, what do I know about um, evolutionary changes in, in our flora and fauna, so our plants and animals as a response to climate change? So it's a really important thing to consider. When, we, when I think about fish populations or we think about tree species or birds, whatever it might be, all of these organisms have evolved with some sort of natural um, climate. Um, as we see us as humans driving changes in that climate, the question is, can these species cope 
with the rapidity of the warming. And so what we are seeing is that in many species of, of animals, their first response is to move. If climate changes in an area, they shift their distributions. If they can't shift their distributions, natural selection will kick in, and they either are going to have the genes in their composition to adapt and cope with that stress, or they're going to perish. And so different species have been able to um, cope with the stress and are, are evolving. Others are going, being driven to extinction. And that's, and that's sort of, it. there's winners and losers with this climate change. Um, and that's sort of uh, how I'll leave it, I guess.